Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of This Is My Bourbon Podcast. I am your host, Perry, and with me this week, as he usually is now, is the co-host, Eric. Are you ready? One, eventually, and it's going to be at the point where I think I'm tired of you, <laughs> I'm going to stop laughing <laughs> after you do your intros. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm never going to get tired of you, buddy. How you doing? I'm good, man. Great. I feel like I just saw you. Like a little over 12 hours ago. Yeah. We had a great stream last night. Great stream. Thank you, everybody, who stopped in for that 1,000 subscriber stream over on YouTube. That was fantastic. Just shed a kiss. Everybody was active. Everybody was jumping in there. It was fun. I don't. I said this on the, the Patreon pregame chats. I don't mean for this to be what I measure it by, but... It was easily the most profitable <laughs> live stream I've ever had. And I just thank you guys so much. Some of y'all know that I'm in between contracts as well with work. So uh, money's been a little tight, <laughs> a little tight around here. So I appreciate you guys. It was, And it was a good opportunity for me to have to actually do some work and you not like you did have to tally up, you know, the, I, the giveaway stuff. But Donnie did most of that. But now I have to pour the samples and I have to get the packaging ready and I have to ship stuff out. So I'll I'll do a little bit of work for the podcast <laughs> other than just show up and talk. I'm going to refrain from saying anything. What? <laughs> it's not about you. Oh. <laughs> Swan's a deadbeat. Anyway, I'm <laughs> just kidding. Oh, no. I'm just kidding. Oh. Swan was lovely. I oh, never. I, that, no. That's a horrible thing for me to say. <laughs> that swan opens the door and then he slowly just backs out the, he was like gonna join us he was gonna surprise us yeah. by showing up for an episode <laughs> you just see him walking away swan come back come back I didn't mean it swan swan hopefully I think he'll be on in a few episodes he will be on in a few episodes for episode 200 Ooh. I've been doing some homework for 200 too so I got something have you really yes oh my gosh what what have you discovered during your homework I have discovered that your voice has changed a little bit. <laughs> I think that part of that has to do with the fact that I've gained a little weight. I think you sound more manly. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Oh, well. And I've discovered, oh my goodness. So so just a little <laughs> inside scoop. I got a little game planned for Pawn. pawn. <laughs> That's Is that Perry and Swan together? Pawn? <laughs> I got a Game. I thought for a second that you had said pond, pond. which is which is what a swan lives in, pond. and that you were doing some weird word association. Perry and Swan, I put it together, <laughs> but we're going to play a game where I'm going back through older episodes, and I'm going through reviews, and I'm going to blind them, and I'm going to say, this person, or no, I'm going to say, who do you think said this about this poor, and I'm going to read a quote that you all said. Man, or this, you are putting a lot of effort into this. Oh, yeah. Who, this person, who do you think gave this one a 13? And like, I'm just going to, you know, I don't think there's going to be any prizes involved for who wins. It's just going to be fun <laughs> I because I found some good quotes that I honestly think you guys, you're, you're going to question yourselves back will, in the day. Okay. Will you also be including reviews from Curtis and Tanner? I have, I have, uh, I know of several that I got you, you Swan and Curtis. Okay. I can go back even farther. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm just, I'm asking because I need to be prepared. Oh, okay. I was like, like are they going to be on the show too? <laughs> you know, I had thought about it at one point, but it's a lot of bodies out yeah. here in the studio. <laughs> but yeah, these most of most of the ones I've found that I've uh, I've liked and that I actually own the bottles to make the samples of uh, Curtis is on those too. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Awesome. So it should be fun. I get a little sentimental around these times where it's like, man, things were so different back then. And they were so simple. Simpler times. We were just doing, we were just having fun. And now it's so serious. We got Harry's razor ads. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We haven't had an ad in a long time. Please somebody sponsor the show. Anyway. <laughs> Hawaii. <laughs> hey, also... <laughs> I forgot about that joke. Um, also, 
if you are here for the first time, we're five minutes into this episode and I haven't said this yet. Uh, if you're here for the first time and you have not yet subscribed, please do. Thank you so much for checking out the uh, the show right before we hit our new, our, our next big landmark, I guess. Benchmark. Benchmark I 200. I don't freaking know. Uh, I just, I've been doing this a while now. <laughs> Four years. Jeez. If you're returning also, thank you so much for coming back. Uh, if you have not yet, please subscribe to the YouTube channel, of course, youtube.com slash this is my bourbon podcast. Go follow the show on social media at my bourbon pod. Uh, Eric is at Whiskey Mutant. I am. He just hit a thousand <laughs> followers da, 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 on Instagram. Da, da, da. That was Explosion. <laughs> you make me laugh a lot. <laughs> I don't know if you've noticed that or not, but... Um, and uh, uh, also, yeah, Patreon, patreon.com slash my bourbon podcast for as little as a dollar a month. You can support the show. Five bucks a month gets you a bunch of bonus content, including but not limited to the pregame chats and the newly revived last call, which we did a last call for last week's episode. We did. And it was special. It's very special. It was something else. It, it's, it's one of the most unique dates I've been on since uh, <laughs> high school. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> <coughs> I'm sorry, <coughs> choked on my mushroom. Um, but that, I also—that's a true thing, right? I, now. The, I the amount of laughter I had to cut out <laughs> of that though to make it sound listenable and to make it like it, it was really in the moment. It was so much laughter. I, I mean, <clears throat> there were times where like I had to do multiple takes for lines because I just could not get them out. The the misery business joke still is one of the funniest things I think I've ever said in my entire life. And I'm so happy that I have it on the record. A fiver. <laughs> I'm going to go drop him a fiver and see if he knows misery business. <laughs> oh, I do love some Paramore. <laughs> uh, that and the Kiss cover band line. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Uh, anyway, if you want to go see what I'm talking about, patreon.com slash my bourbon podcast. Uh, it would be really nice if we got over a hundred patrons over there as well. Do it. Sometime. Let's do it. We'll do another giveaway. Yeah, we will. Why the heck not? I'm all about it. So, uh, we've been over the past few weeks replacing flying blind with pears and pores or whatever the heck we're calling The pear bears. The pears. The po- Yeah, that. Um, pears, pears. Pears, pears. <laughs> pear, pear. <laughs> And this week, we got a real weird one. Real interesting. But dang it if these things aren't good. They are. They are baked wheat crackers. Um, and but they look like, they look in, like tiny mushrooms. Yeah. I'll, yeah, look out for that. I'll put that up on uh, Instagram and the Facebook group. But it's a, little, it's a little wheat cracker with a chocolate-shaped, a mushroom-shaped chocolate on top of it. It's strange, man. It's strange, but good. <laughs> and we decided to grab some Four Roses with this one. We did. It was an OBSQ 10-year, 10 10-month 10 pick mm. from uh, Liquor Barn. 111 proof. But truthfully, it doesn't drink like it's that high. No. No, it does not overpower the little, the little lot cracker mushroom cookie thing. This is the most niche one. Like this is, I feel like this is the one that people aren't going to be able to access as much. No, because I can't even think of anything that's similar to this. Oh, maybe. Um, so, what are the little? They're usually in like the weird candy section. They're little little bear crackers that have like a filling on the inside of them. You got the one aisle that's the regular candy section, and then the <laughs> next one down is the weird candy section. <laughs> it's like if you go to like uh, Fye or something at the mall, they have like oh the, yeah. The anime snacks and stuff. And it's the little bears, and they have like a, this little feeling, and I don't know. <laughs> but it's a. <laughs> you, that really fell apart quickly. <laughs> uh, scrap that. Garbage that. No, I'm, I'm leaving it. Uh, I'm leaving it in. But the people deserve to know. Either way, this is a little, <laughs> a little cookie cracker with chocolate on it. And when you add that Four Roses pick, it tastes like you're eating cinnamon rolls with chocolate icing. But yeah, I mean, if you can find something similar, try it out. I bet that other Four Roses recipes would work mm -hmm. pretty well with this also. I almost just spilled the entire rest of the bag. Terrific. We're good. 
They are. And uh, I have to save a couple for <laughs> Lucy, Lucy to try. But I think I'm going to send you home with the rest of the moon pies from yeah. last week. I got I got to let um, April try that. And I know my one of my kids that loves chocolate is going to love them. Lucy tried one after we got done recording last week. And she took a bite and she was like, oh, it's like a moon pie. This is really good. And I go, yeah, I know. It's like a... Like a like a real moon pie, and she go like it took a second, it took a beat, and she was like, "Nope, changed my mind. We <sighs> suck, Lucy." <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> but thanks, Don Nishita. Yes, Don. Thank you as always for sponsoring Pears Pours. Yeah. And once um, once we've gone through Don's snacks, we may have some more. We do have some more. Our friend Jason and Natalie. Sent me some more snacks like this, so we've got a whole slew of snacks to go through. Long time friends. Come on, that's a weird thing to say. Long, long time, time friends. friends. Been friends with them for a long time. They actually have both been on the podcast before after uh, Southern Whiskey Society. I think it was when it was. Yeah. Uh, back in 2019. And uh, also long time supporters of the yeah. show. They're so well. so nice. They're wonderful, wonderful, great people. people. And I haven't seen them since <clears throat> before the pandemic. Yeah, because they were at Whiskey Weekend, weren't they? <laughs> yeah, they were. Yeah. So I miss you guys. But yeah, they sent me a whole box. I may do a few on my uh, Whiskey Mutant page, but then I'm going to save some to do on here too. So Dope. plenty of content. Lots of content. You know what else is content? Telling people what we've been drinking recently, which is what you're going to do right now. <clears throat> I'm going to do it right now. <laughs> um, well, we met up with our uh, buddy Fred uh, this past uh, weekend, and uh, Swan was there. Um, we had some pours, but I think I'm going to talk about the, uh, I got a bottle of Blackened slash Willet, and I'm, I think it's I think it's unique enough to talk about. I, I, saw, think, <laughs> I saw somebody say on Facebook today that it tastes like cat pee. <laughs> they are absolutely wrong about it's that. It's not that bad. Uh, they, so, okay. I enjoyed Blackened Willet. Um, it's six to eight year Willet Rise finished in, what is it, Madeira? Madeira cast? Yes. If you enjoy Willet Rye, I think you're going to like this. It. The finishing adds maybe a little bit to it, but it's still, to me, more like just will it rye. MSRP is $150. So I don't know if the price adds up, but people complaining about the price are also the same people that complain about will it prices anyway. Yeah. Um, so I think if you are actually going... <laughs> It's me. It's me. It me. <laughs> if you're actually going for this bottle, I think you know you you're going to expect it to be a little pricey. Yeah, and it was. I I honestly I had more time sitting around talking with everybody as we discussed all this same stuff. Yep. And I think that made the pour better. If than if I would have just been by myself yeah. having it. I wasn't over the moon about it. I do think that it's wildly overpriced for what it is mm -hmm. um but i didn't dislike it i think i think if they made like a normal like shelf bottle that was just will it rye finished in madeira and it was like 75 bucks i think that would be it'd be perfect yeah but you know, it's it's a limited product. It's got the blackened name on it, so yeah, it's a little pricey. But I enjoyed sharing that with everybody because it was one of the first times. You know, nobody really talked about it. hadn't read anything about it. Yeah, and we got to experience that together and talk about it. That's one of my favorite things. And and you know, <clears throat> the pandemic absolutely just tanked those possibilities, unless you had the same bottle as as somebody else. And you right. Could, you know talk over FaceTime or Zoom or whatever, but, you know, it's nice that we can kind of do that yeah. again and be small, safe about small it. Small groups and, and yeah. Yeah, exactly. 
I want to talk about another thing that Fred brought as well. It was from Farm and Grain, I think is the name of the distillery. Was that one with like a thousand mash bills? Yeah, in it? so it it's a product called Mash Build. And I had never heard of them before. I didn't either. I hadn't. And Farm and Spirit, excuse me. Okay. And it it's insane. It had what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine individual mash bills oh, in this. Products ranging from anywhere of the years 2000 to 2018. So, I don't know if that meant that there was 20-year whiskey in this thing, but th- there was a lot of product yeah. that went into this blend. And they put it all on the label, too. They did. It's such a dense label, but I love it. It made me so happy to see all of that information on there. And man, I was so surprised by it, too. I really, really enjoyed it. And I, I put it on social media, and Rich, who I believe is the founder of Farm and Spirit, sent me a message. And was like, hey, let's get in, get in touch about this. And he was like, now, they're in Denver. (laughs) I want to put this in context. I called him the other day, and we were talking about getting him on the podcast. And he was like, if you want, because it's not that that long of a trip, (laughs) if you come, I'll put you up, and we can do podcasts and taste through everything. And I was, like, thinking about it. I'm going... Denver's an 18-hour drive. That's not like a hop, skip, and a jump away. Road trip. <laughs> that's, that's a little bit of time that I've got to commit to traveling. And so I think Rich is actually going to come here oh. <laughs> so we could do a podcast with him instead of me trekking with uh, an 11-month-old at some point. See, that, that happens... The road trip out there happens when we get that um, like Travel Channel show that we you know where we oh yeah we podcast and we stop at local bars and stuff on the way and we just do like twelve episodes all the way to Colorado. Fifty drinks in fifty states. Heck yeah! Don't steal our ideas. I don't. Are we going to be able to get the car to Hawaii? Yeah, we'll fly it over. Get on a boat. Oh, like a ferry. Yeah. <laughs> The world's longest ferry <laughs> ride <laughs> from California to Hawaii. <laughs> That's really funny hey. to me. <laughs> Somebody's commuting every day. <laughs> their, com- their commute is 12 hours long. <laughs> and then they work for eight and they never sleep. <laughs> they just never. <laughs> they also don't have a family. <laughs> no life at all. <laughs> hey, what are you up to? Working. <laughs> I'm working. (laughs) Always working or driving or riding to work. (laughs) Ferry from Floating to work. (laughs) Ferry from California to Hawaii. (laughs) Oh, I love it so much. So last week, we said we were going to have this little topic. And it was because I got to interview Joe Beatrice, the founder of Barrel. By the way, if you've not listened to that episode, please go do so. Um, I felt like it was a return to form for me. In terms of interviews, uh, if you are an old, long-time fan of the podcast and also a fan of interviews that I have done, uh, you are going to love this, I think. And Eric even texted me and said, hey, good job. I did. I enjoyed it. A little bit of um, validation. Because it was one of those interviews that, you know, you got to like specific topics, but then... It was like having a conversation with somebody, you know, and he, that's, yeah. that's how I do interviews. Right, right. I mean, it, it's so boring just to have like right. a set, set questions of, and yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, I typically will go into interviews with a couple of things that I want to talk about, a th- like general topics. And, you know, usually I'll have a way to get into that topic of conversation, but for the most part. I, and I tell everybody that I interview this, I tell everybody that I interview this thing before we start the interview. I I don't have anything prepared. <laughs> I've done some research. 
I know who you are. <clears throat> I can talk to that. But as far as questions go, this is a conversation. And otherwise, it just feels impractical. It feels invalid to me to do it any other way. So that's what sets me apart, I guess. I mean, you you had a conversation with the, I guess, the founder of Barrel. Is yeah. that right? And you put in a Narnia reference in there. I mean, there's, <laughs> I mean, who can say they did that? Anybody? Me. Just you. <laughs> and then he came back with another one. Yeah, that's what I'm me. saying. I was like, well, dang, man. That, that was perfect. Right. That's the thing is like, if, if I can have a conversation with somebody for the podcast and we can bounce off of each other, that's what makes it special to me. Yep. That's what gets me excited about interviews and whatnot. Anyway, so the topic for this week, enough about last week. This is something that I thought about after my interview with him. And people are so... <laughs> They're so willing to talk about what's the best distilleries to source from. I want to flip it. I want to talk about what the worst distilleries could be. When you asked to me that too, that I started thinking. I was like, "Oh, well, this is an interesting question." And it's and it's not always like who has the worst product. No, 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 no. That's not really what I. We're not we're not taking shots at anybody no. today. It's what would be the hardest distillery to source a barrel from, and then. With full transparency, include it in your product, right? Yeah. <clears throat> whether it's logistics, whether it's the the way that people view that distillery or company, whatever you want to say, whatever you want to call it, uh, and and what the general outcome would be, how people would respond to it. Yeah. So there's one that sticks out in my mind. There's one that sticks out in my mind, too. I wonder... Hopefully it's not the same because... Well, I think if it is, though, we could have a pretty good conversation yeah, about true. it. Um, do you want to go first? I'll go first. Go first. So, like Perry said before, this is not us bashing anything because this distillery, I love them. It's Maker's Mark. Oh, wow. Maker's Mark. That wasn't mine. Okay, so, good. Here yeah. we go. <laughs> so, when I started thinking about this question, I was thinking... This is a really good one, actually. <laughs> Maker's Mark has such great products we love i love maker's mark perry loves maker's mark i have tons of selects i love regular maker's mark maker's mark 101 great it's great but what else do they have nothing nothing it's one product if i am yes <laughs> that's the best yeah absolutely if, i love this answer so much if i'm setting up a, a new company or um uh, you know a brand I can't go to Maker's Mark. You can't, yeah. I mean... <clears throat> you could. You could, and you could blend it with other products. Right. But I think that it is so distinctive I, that you would be doing yourself a disservice. Exactly. Because think of, like, the different things Maker's Mark I hadn't even products they this. do. They add staves to their regular distillate. You know? There's no Maker's Mark just single barrel. We don't even know. I mean, I'm sure there's something out there. At least I don't know. Um, what a just straight up barrel from Maker's Mark would taste like cast strength single barrel. Yeah, exactly. Um, so one, you're taking a risk on not even knowing what the product's going to taste like. Two, there's probably a very good chance it's just going to taste like Maker's Mark. Exactly. <laughs> so like, like you said, you may have to use it to blend, but you're not going to be able to just buy like a hundred barrels of Maker's Mark, bottle it, and then just sell it without it being Maker's Mark. <laughs> <laughs> and and you know i love maker's mark but if i'm sourcing like that's probably one of the last places i would go yeah absolutely and i i do think that it could probably hold up pretty well in a blend i think that it could provide a pretty interesting extra context to the 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 final product but yeah that that's that's like a no-brainer yeah i feel like because they're literally just making one product with one mash bill. Right. You don't just even... Just with di different iterations. Right. There's no rye to choose from. There's no rye bourbon. It's just a weeder. And that's all you got to choose from, <laughs> you know? So I went a slightly different route with my answer. 
And I think that we could we we can have a discussion as well, talk about other possibilities. But the one that jumped out at me immediately was Buffalo Trace. And the reason is because everybody is already so up in arms about the fact that they can't even get the product out that everybody wants. That if they started allocating barrels <laughs> to somebody else, like sourcing barrels for somebody else, people would lose their minds. That's a good all, one. All of a sudden, you you know how you can't get Antique 107? Well, now you're not going to be able to get it for another five years. <laughs> we were going to have a huge release of George T. Stag this year, but we actually sold five barrels, so we're going to have to be a little bit shorter on our yield this time around. And then all of a sudden, that... Uh, company, new company is just allocated out the, you know. <laughs> yeah. It's like schmorge schmag. <laughs> Some people are a lot, and that people are showing up at Buffalo Trace to get some schmorge stag. Yeah. And like, they're like, that's not even our company. What do you th- We don't know anything about it. But I, I just think, I think that would send people <laughs> through the roof in terms of how upset they would be. I just, I can't imagine a worse business move that buffalo trace could make other than saying like oh we're only weller now <laughs> <laughs> buffalo weller <laughs> and, and looking at another side of it like who's going to actually be able to go in there and be like i want to buy a thousand barrels from you guys <laughs> like, they, u- they use like every last drop of what they make exactly for their own products and I mean, maybe you could do some kind of contract distilling with them, but again, they're in such high demand, and people want those products so badly that they would just be screwing themselves over by selling their barrels off to somebody else. It makes perfect. That's sense. my that's my answer for this. But maybe we're building the worst possible company (laughs) the worst craft distillery that's not it's just not even a really distillery it's just the worst so blend this imaginary craft distillery we're we're building yeah do are they because i want to look at it this way too are they transparent or are okay yes they are 100 transparent they're like this is our old recipe from the forges of well, the hills of Kentucky. Not not even that. It's not them going, oh, this was distilled in Bardstown, Kentucky, and then bottled in uh, Irvine, California, or or whatever. Like It's just, they're like, yeah, we got it from Buffalo Trace. Yeah, we got it from Maker's Mark. <laughs> like, you can't do anything more to shoot yourself in the foot than just with at least those two distilleries be like, yeah, what are you going to do about it? And you got to have... <laughs> You got to have the confidence to be like, I can take some of Buffalo Trace's product and I can make it into something better. <laughs> you know, can you though? <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Like, yeah, oh, no, no, no. I agree. You? I agree with you, but it's like, you got to be like, come on. Yeah. That's some, I mean, maybe Dixon. I, I don't look, <laughs> there are people that I think could do wonders, but at the same time, Dixon knows when to, when to call a spade a spade. <laughs> yeah. Like, he gave me, I, I still have some of it. This, I won't say where it's from. I'll tell you later. But he gave me a sample of this distillate from a particular distillery that he just straight up said, I can't use this for anything. Like, it's not good enough. It's from a distillery that it should have been good enough. But, like, he bought it and he kept trying to find ways to make it work. And it just wasn't working and so he gave me like some just to <laughs> Ooh. do you want me to get it yeah i love this little sample bottle though. i do too it's cool i've, I've never seen it anything almost looks like, like a spice a spice bottle yeah. <laughs> or a pill bottle yeah like a <laughs> like a thousand count tylenol <laughs> bottle oh interesting oh Wow, that's different. I don't hate it. I don't hate it. I like. I, I I genuinely like it, but I don't know. <laughs> he's the he's the expert, not me. Yeah, but, but like, I guess I guess you got to think in terms of maybe blending. Like, it may be good, decent by itself, unique, but it may turn something into like you know, like Joe was talking in uh, 
the uh, interview last week, it could just change it yeah. for the worse, mm-hmm. you know, take it somewhere that you don't even want it to go. But, I mean, again, he knows what he's talking about. Right. And I, I am happy that I have a little bit of this because this is something that literally nobody else has. <laughs> And there's not a whole lot of it left either. There's not. But you see what I mean, though? Like, this particular distillery can do better and has done better. Yeah. But it is a little bit reminiscent of something that came out this year. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Anyway, I don't want to give too much else away. Here's another. This is a little bit broader of an answer, too, though. I think it would be a horrible, horrible idea to source from a distillery, craft or otherwise, that you've never had their product from before. That's it's very similar to what I said about makers. Like yeah. we've not had any like single barrels to <clears throat> to know what we're getting into. So you imagine just calling up some random distillery and be like, "I want a fifty barrels right now. Yeah. Let's do this." And and like. Maybe not even all 50, but like 40 out of them turn out to be crap yeah, <laughs> or crap adjacent. I mean, and you're just like, well, now I'm stuck with this. What am I supposed to do? But even like, I, I mean, I'm, I'm even talking about like startup distilleries where they only have, you know, a certain run of products. Like if this is not the case, but like if Wilderness Trail had had, like, garbage distillate. But you invested in them, and you're like, I want 20 of my own barrels. Yeah. I'm going to pay for them right Right now. now. Like, that's a bad business move. (laughs) Like, in a year, I want to be able to start my own little blending company. And so I'm going to buy from you before it even starts. See what I mean? Like yep. it could it could be so bad for it could be you. horrible. Yeah. And to your point on another side of things, I think I just feel like sourcing from somebody or an area that has a very distinct flavor is not interesting or good at all. Yeah. I mean, a good example is obviously Dickel. Mm -hmm. You know, like everybody, you know, tons of people source it. They blend it together. They figure out a way to make it work. But almost any single barrel that you get that's just that, you know what it is. Yeah. And it's like, I don't want to go and just buy another one of those in a different bottle. Yeah, exactly. And like, that's the thing that we've all been kind of finding ourselves exhausted with, with (laughs) All of the Barton product mm-hmm. that has been repackaged or reblended or whatever recently. I just, I don't want to buy any more sourced Barton. Especially <laughs> just, when it's $100 don't. or more. Exactly. And and sometimes it's barely cracking the, of like the 10 year mark. Yep. I don't want to buy that. Stop trying to sell it to me. I know that people are buying it because it's got like clout or whatever behind it and it's different and then people can, you know, share it. But at the same time, I don't care. I want no. something. I want something else. But there, I mean, there are instances where it's worked out. I mean, Sam Houston worked out really well. Calumet's kind of been hit or miss. I feel like, but even still, even I, so, I I know I've had them. They're great, but I still, knowing that it's the same, like where it's from, and it's the same stuff as something that somebody else is using, it just makes me turn, it almost turns me away from that whole category altogether. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, well, I'm going back over here to where I can get, you know, something I'm used to that I can afford and buy two or three bottles as opposed to the same thing in a different bottle. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I, I was thinking of this, and I'm not... I'm not a big fan of Texas whiskey. What? How do you feel about sourcing products? Say you're from Kentucky, you're making a Kentucky company, and you sourced a bunch of barrels from Texas. I think that it could work really well if, again, you had other product that you were blending it with. Texas whiskey is just always so 
overly oaky. Yeah, it's got a distinct, you know, a distinct taste or feel that just Texas whiskey has. Yeah. And I just don't think you could take that, bottle it into a single barrel and put, you know. No, people would know. Yeah. They would they would know if it were a <laughs> Texas whiskey right. single barrel. But, like, if you were trying to blend it with, I mean, even like a four-year high rye bourbon from Kentucky, I think that the two of those, when they actually got blended, could make up something really unique and really different. But as it stands on its own, no. not a... And if you and if you're move. if you're a new company, unless you've got that master blender behind you that has the knowledge yeah. to make that work, I have, it's going to be really difficult for somebody brand new to the game coming in and making some product. You know, I don't know. I don't know what the process is. I don't know how many how much gets wasted when you're blending and stuff like that. So, you know, as far as like money and like product goes, like you don't want to take a chance on wasting anything. So maybe a new company with a experienced person behind it could blend something good into it. Yeah. But it's it I just this is like when I'm thinking about this and I'm thinking of money and like putting budgets into it like it's like anxiety like I'm I'm like <laughs> there is these, I've noticed you getting a little bit less expressive like, as we've been yeah, talking about I'm this. I'm like oh this is this is money we're talking about here <laughs> like shoo. I I I'll say this one, too. And I don't think that this is the worst place that you could source from, but I think that everybody has done it to death that you're almost doing yourself a disservice at this point. MGP. Yeah. Everybody and their brother has had an MGP-sourced whiskey at this point. And not, it's not it's not been bad. It's genuinely not been bad. But... Do something different. <laughs> I think the best MGPs I've had lately are the ones where the people have, they picked the barrels and they've brought them back to their place and they maybe aged them or finished them differently. Not just give me a five-year-old barrel, put it in yeah. a bottle and go. Um, and I think, I think in order to make it work, you got to have people who, I don't know how it works with MGP. If you can go there, sample like a batch of barrels and be like, ooh, I like these, and then you buy that group, or if you just say, I want this, and they just send them to you. I don't know how that works. But I feel like if you've got like a good – so Nashville Barrel Company is a mm-hmm. is a, an example that uses MGP. And those guys have a great background of like awesome barrel picking. And in my head, they – went to MGP and they sampled barrels and they were like, Oh, these are going to turn into something great. We're going to bring them back to Nashville. We're going to age them, put them in a thing. And these are going to turn into something good. I don't know if it worked out that way. As far as picking them, they did bring them back to Nashville and they have their place now. But like you said, like there's so much four to five year MGP right now. And it's just not, it's like we get it. We get it. Yeah. (laughs) Just do something new. Yeah. Do something else, please. Uh, anyway, any other ones you think of? Maker's Mark was my big one, and then yeah, BT was my big one. Yeah, and then it's kind of that's a weird noise. I think just just any place that doesn't have a variety and age to it is just not a good choice. Yeah, I think like obviously Heaven Hill is a good choice because they've got age, they've got several, you know different mash bills. You could pick up some really unique things. You know, I don't think going to like a newer distillery that's, unless you plan on letting it age maybe for 10 more years, if you've got that time. Yeah. Then yeah, that might be good. But as far as a new distill, a new company putting out some product, I think you got to pick somewhere that's got a lot of stock. They've got some age. They got some choices to choose from. You can blend some stuff together. Yeah. And uh, put something out there. I don't have anything else to say. <laughs> you kind of summed it up for me. <laughs> hey, I'm trying to I'm trying to help out. You're here. contributing. Yes. You're doing the work. You're putting in the I'm hours. Not just about pairing, man. Okay. <laughs> I'm not just here to pair. I'm more than just a pairing face. <laughs> I'm just, more than just a pairing mutant to you. <laughs> Cut me and I bleed. <laughs> <laughs> 
I plead the same whiskey that you do, okay? <laughs> okay. Anyway, we also have a review that we want to get to. So this is Barrel Batch 30. 30. <laughs> Barrel Bourbon Batch 30. Um, initially, when they sent me this, uh, they had an incorrect label on it, and it said it was only distilled in Kentucky. Not true. It's distilled in Tennessee, Indiana, Kentucky, and Wyoming. Oh, mm -hmm. that's cool. So 117.32 proof. Don't really have any information on age or anything. Uh, but as is pretty typical with barrel products, at least in their their regular line, this is about $90 to $100. Now, as Eric can tell from the sample bottle, I've had this a couple of times. And to be quite honest with you, I like it. <laughs> it's almost gone. I have not, not enjoyed drinking on this one. And truth be told, most of the, the barrel sample bottles that I get don't last super long <laughs> around here. Um, I have just been enamored with what they've been putting out over the past couple of years. And th truth be told, too, I, I wouldn't have had the chance to taste all of them if it hadn't been for uh, our buddy Aaron, who is the, the PR leader for Barrel, always reaching out and saying, hey, there's a new batch coming out. There's some new products. Uh, you know, do you want to try any of them? And I'll just say, yeah. And um, also, have you had Stellum yet? Um, no. We can try those. I mean, we don't have to review them, but we can also try those. But they he sent full 750s of those. And that's as well. Barrel's other line. Yeah, right? it's their like budget affordable line. Something we didn't talk about <laughs> earlier, too. Uh, the wise man. Oh, yeah. Let's put a pause. Just just a brief little, little pause-arino here. What is that stupid word I just said? Pause-arino. I hate it so much. Let's, let's it sounds like a, like a local pizzeria. Let's go down to Pazzarino's <laughs> for a pizza pie. It doesn't sound too different from Pazzo's. True. Well, that's probably why I thought of that. Did you know the Pazzo was closed? Yes. I'm so bummed, man. I love that place. That was one of my favorite pizza places around here. Anyway. So, <laughs> the wise man is Kentucky Owl's new affordable bottle. It's like 60 bucks, and I think the youngest is like four or five years old in it. I want to try it so badly. I'm so curious. I don't even like the label. I, it's messy. Ugh. It's such a mess. And it, it really does feel like a step down in quality from the actual Kentucky Owl products. I mean, it does, it looks like it's not even from the same company. And yeah, and that's kind of how. That's kind of how I always felt about Confiscated, too. I feel like it, it's still kind of on, it's, yeah. you know, it's, it, you can just tell it's, and it, it was made to be a more budget yeah. thing, but you can tell it just didn't have that Kentucky Owl, like, yeah, you know, glowing in the, in the glass case. In the thing. sun, yeah. Yeah. The heavens open up and a, <laughs> right. a bottle descends. Um, but yeah, I saw that picture, uh, you had in the group, and I was just like, oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> I Somebody said, I can't remember who it was, that it looks more like a scotch bottle. I think it does look more like a scotch bottle. It looks like that eight, eight buck <laughs> bottle or something like that, that one <laughs> brand. <laughs> if you can eight. tell, we're a little critical of what they've done with this product since Dixon's left. Um <laughs> I just got to know what it's what it's like. Oh well, yeah, we gotta try it. I've got to know, and I probably I will, not gonna send us any after. What we've been. I never sent us any anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna put my hard-earned money on the table and actually pick one of those bad boys up. 
I'll, I'll go in with you. All right. For content. For, it's all for the greater content good. All about the content. <laughs> I can't not hear no any more about the content. <laughs> anyway. Job, the content. Anyway, Bill. I don't want any questions about the content. It smells really good. Let me tell you what this smells like to me. I would love to hear what this smells like to you. I know. I always like. I always want to make sure you get your notes in your head before, but it smells like cookie dough. Ooh. Like like you're mixing up like homemade cookie dough before you've made a cookie or anything. Yeah. You know what I always love too. I I prefer, and this is even extended to my my old fashions. I prefer to use brown sugar instead of like regular sugar. Mm-hmm. So I guess that's what like demerara syrup instead of simple syrup. Yeah. But I I just think that it gives a bolder quality to the the cocktail itself and I think that when you know it, if if you can find instances where you can replace regular white sugar with brown sugar I just think that it's a more complex and and fun product that yeah, you know flavor and i i'm getting that cookie dough from you as well but it's cookie dough with brown sugar okay i think it's just got a really nice complexity to it. oh yeah yeah you could definitely dig into this for a while it reminds me a lot of four roses oh it's almost like a uh I want to say like an OBSO or something yeah, like that. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Which is my favorite recipe, too. Oh, it's so nice and round. Oh, the palate. Oh, that's... I know it's a generic thing, but it's bold. <laughs> oh, there's a lot going on there. It's spicy, too. It's that's, like creeping up into my gums. Mm-hmm. <laughs> It's got a really, really good mouthfeel to it. It does. It's all over the place. There's some like vanilla cream tucked away in there, too. I was going to say almost like a... uh... An eggnog, like you get that really like nutmeg, oh, cinnamon, okay. but it's kind of creamy. Yeah. It's like a r- spicy e- eggnog. Maybe you use a little bit of rye in there along with some rum and different things. Spicy eggnog all the way. After I, I took a sip, I, I went back to the nose and I can kind of pick out a little bit more of the younger product in there. That's good. It is. And I, I think that this is a really good indication of when younger product helps to balance out the overly oaky, over aged, not even over aged, but more hyper aged products that, that might go into a blend. And I, I know that people are so adamant about. Well, I gotta see the age statement. I gotta know what's in it. And it's like, you know what? Sometimes maybe you don't want to know what's in it. Because if you see there an age statement of four years old yeah. on a bottle that's a hundred bucks, you're gonna be pissed. Right. That's straight but that's up, yeah. but but that is the definition of an age statement, is that it's gotta have the youngest product in it on the label, if you're going to provide an age statement. So I mean it's possible that there's sixteen year whiskey in this. Yeah, and then it's possible that they wanted to use a three-year-old rye or, you know, a bourbon or whatever to finish off to give it that one little Mm -hmm. thing that they wanted. So, yeah, like you said, you don't want to see an age-stated three-year, $100 thing. Okay, so here we go. So, Aaron actually provided the age breakdown for everything that went into this blend. Five... Wasn't too far off with the four. Okay. Six, nine, 10, 11, and 15-year-old barrels distilled and aged in Tennessee, Kentucky, Indiana, and Wyoming. 
And uh, as we said, bottled at cast strength, 117.32, MSRP of 90. So, yeah, you've got some five-year-old product in there, but you also got some 15. Yeah. So. <laughs> to be able to just put that many different aged whiskeys together and make something good that blows my mind yeah it, it's it's a true testament to not just joe but but trip stimson as well mm -hmm. and the fact that they are so knowledgeable and they take the time to be very cognizant of what is going into a blend and and taking the time to step back and say this isn't working let's try something else and it it's it's a really good blend I really, really like this. Um, I know that ninety dollars is a little bit high, but how much are you going to find on the market with a blend that has fifteen-year-old product in it? Uh, not, not many no. things. And I think that comes with. I just think that comes with the knowledge that we have about products and the ease of looking it up like if you don't i'm not talking about getting on the internet and taking a picture and then waiting for somebody on a facebook group <laughs> to say is this worth it i'm talking about like if you're on the fence go to barrel's website or go to a, a review place or listen to a podcast that breaks it down for you because i can appreciate 90 dollars when i know there's that many different products in it, and the people behind it are going to do a good job. They wouldn't have sent us that information if they didn't want other people to know. Exactly. They you want know, people it's, to know. It's, it was given to us for a reason, and that reason is to let you, the listener, know that it's okay to spend 90 bucks on a product that is not all you know double-digit aged exactly it's got some younger stuff in it but it's making it better because of it yeah you can find the information and it may help you justify the price like to me that that 90 dollars is a lot i have to think about it yeah. but i know what's going into it i know the work i know the products i know what it took to make it that way and i understand it yeah i feel completely different about a product that may just have a 15 year old age statement on it and i have to ask 15 different people where do you think this came from well i think it came from this i you know what i'm gonna go get something else i'm gonna go get something that i can actually find the information about and i think a good example of that and i'm not trying to call them out because i really do like what's in the bottle but when you're talking about like three chord with whiskey drummer yeah they did put out a 15 year old bourbon for what Two hundred and twenty dollars. It's not cheap. That's a good chunk of change that has you know that has to be dropped in order to pick up a pretty premium product. Uh, but I mean, there there are also alternatives to it. We did that episode with um, Chad from My Daily Bourbon, uh, where we compared <laughs> the <coughs> what? No. What? No. Okay. I'm not sure what that was about. Um, but where we uh, we compared the Whiskey Drummer to the Hickory Hill 15. And one of them's like, the Hickory Hill was like $100 cheaper. And it was like, yeah, there, there's not a big enough difference between right. the two to where you can say, well, I have to shell out the extra dollars to pick up the Whiskey Drummer. That's just how it is, man. It is. I, I mean, the, uh, the, I agree. the market is so wild and uncontrollable <laughs> anymore. But I, it, I do appreciate the fact, though, as we were saying, that this product exists on the market at its price point, and it, you're not going to be disappointed in it, I don't think. No. I mean, everything that I've had from Barrel has been... So good. Oh, they're dovetail. Man, I need to dig out all of my my barrel samples. That'd be a fun stream or a fun episode to do where we just drink through. I volunteer. Tribute. <laughs> I've got to have at least like 
a dozen at this point. Not even just like the bourbons, but you know their private releases. Oh, they have their, so many crazy things. I've like, got the seagrass. Seagrass. Too. Have you had seagrass? I haven't. All right, we'll do that after we do our <laughs> our review here. But I, I think that we've talked long enough. We need to actually give a score for this. So our sort, our scoring system rather is uh, nose palette, finish, and price. Each category is out of five. Final score is out of twenty. Eric. Whiskey Mutant Smith. Uh, what what do you give the nose? The nose? Oh, it's cookie dough, man. Ah, uh, It's my favorite flavor of ice cream. I honestly like the nose more than the palate. Just a little. I'm giving it a four. I'm I'm right there with you. I could I could just sit and smell this. It reminds me of just fresh cookies being made in the in the kitchen. Even a little cookie dough ice cream. It's just that cookie dough flavor. I cannot get that out of my head when I smell this. I actually think I might have to flip with you when I think about it. I do really like the nose, but I think that the palate is such a roller coaster that it brings out not only what was present on the nose, but just all of these other little flavors that kind of like have these moments of like popping Mm -hmm. across your tongue. And then somehow it all kind of combines into this like bouquet, 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 (laughs) bouquet. No, don't even. (laughs) Nope. Not going to go there. Um, (laughs) goodness gracious. Um, but it, it's just a, a really well, composed palette, I think, by the end of it. So, I am going to give the nose a 3.5. So, not too much different from yours. I'm going to give the palette a 4, though. I really, really like this palette. I think it's just a great, great drinker. And I'm actually going to give the the finish the same as the nose, 3.5. I think that it kind of drops off a little bit, but it does still linger for a, a good while. I'm I'm kind of flipping what you did. I'm 3.5 on the palate because I like the nose a little better. Yeah. And what would you say on the finish? 3.5 as well. Uh, I'm going to give... I'm going to be a little bit harder on the finish. I'm going to give it a 3. Okay. Only because that is really, to me, the... That's probably the the least my least favorite part. Like you said, I feel like it just with all that going on, I feel like the finish could have just been a little longer. Especially with yeah. we know the age and everything we got yeah, going on. I don't disagree. But other than that, like I mean it's great. Yeah. Okay, ninety dollars. Again, I know that it's a bit much, but Batch to batch, barrel is consistent. It's consistently good. Again, you do have to take into account the value of having 15-year-old product blended in there. How much is in there, we don't really know. But we do know that it, at the very least, is present. For me, am I going to be running out the door to spend $90 on a bottle? No, But I do think that it is a good splurge bottle. And I do think that people should consider it if they're trying to find something different. They're trying to bring something to a tasting or to the table for people who might not have had it before. Or they're trying to show them something that they could get for a little bit more money. It's not budget. Is it value? I I could maybe throw it into the value category considering what some of the premium products are, are calling for in terms of price these days i'm gonna give it a four i'm the same <laughs> i was i was honestly in my head i was echoing everything you said what are uh, we like 0.5 away from each other because yeah, i had like 15 i had 14.5 yeah there you go <laughs> um i i just think it's just a bottle that it's not like you're going like you said you're not going to just get that all the time yeah it's got its occasions it's different you could easily split it between two people and you know, you want to try something different and you know what went into it. I think the, the price is fine. 
and you know it's a good thing to have to share with somebody yeah and talk about it and and i and more and more the more i do this podcast the more i enjoy that than it's I one do, of the best parts of yeah, it than i do anything just talking about the things and like and we all know about Barrel now. Like, it's been out for yeah. a while. Where you, you, you know, it's not like you're just walking in there and you're like, whoa, that's $90. Like, that's how it's been. And they're still making it. So, you know, yeah. it's working. And they're doing well. They're winning awards. Mm-hmm. People are raving about, you know, different batches. and Get it in Narnia. Um, <laughs> but as Aslan actually is, uh, that's, that's his uh, decanter bourbon, his Barrel. <laughs> nice. <laughs> oh, but I think I think when you break it all down, ninety ninety dollars is not bad. No, I don't think so either. It's not perfect, but you know that's why I give it a four. I think it's I think it's okay. Have we had just straight fives across the board yet? I don't think we've had anything like that so far. Uh, Russell's thirteen was close. Russell's thirteen was close, and one of the batches of Elijah Craig Barrel Proof were close. But we're still on the hunt. We're still we're still trying. We're trying to find it. But maybe one day. Trying to get our time machine. Maybe by episode four hundred. <laughs> four. <laughs> you think you'll be around two years from now? Yeah, well. Freaking hope you will. Will you be, be around? I sure as <laughs> I don't know how to edit that stuff. <laughs> I don't know how to put that on podcast stuff i don't know how to do that so if if i'm out of the picture will you continue the podcast i'll try all right <laughs> i may just put it on like of it may just be like a voice memo that i just put on instagram <laughs> for perry russell yeah <laughs> it may just be me and perry russell talking through voice memos once 20 a- 20 minutes you just you've like <laughs> snaked a microphone down into the basement of warehouse x <laughs> Every like other month, like it gets run over by like a a, a lawnmower or something. I have to go back and fix it. <laughs> you give him his own little hot spot so that he, he can get, do live streams gets too. Caught but... in Jimmy's little scooter wheel or something like that. <laughs> there goes my mic again. Got to run it back to Perry Russell. Wonder Warehouse X. Jimmy keeps running over it. Dag on it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, do you want to try this stellum while we're doing our tips and bits? Yeah, give me a little bit. Can I go first on tips and bits? Of course, this you week. Can. Yes. Um, Norm McDonald, You're the host. But, Why are you asking permission from me? Because I normally like allow the co-host to go first. You're the you're you're the I'm, I'm the, the head honcho. I'm the passenger. Buddy. <laughs> uh, Norm McDonald passed away this week, mm. or which just was like not. I don't think anybody was ready for for that at all. But I've never been the biggest fan of Norm Macdonald. He's always just kind of come off as like that snarky guy in in high school who was always kind of a bully, and you didn't. But he was really... kind of like smart about it. And stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And like I, I just I didn't have a whole lot of respect or admiration for him until, of course, people start posting tributes and talking about his style of comedy and ta- and and just seeing. Like, not only the impact that he had on the the world of comedy, but just how unique and special he was and how he, people just loved the guy. And I've been watching clips of, of him since he passed and just like falling in love with some of the jokes that he makes and just... The cadence and the the delivery and and how, like, people say that he was, like, the best Weekend Update host of all time. And it was because he didn't give a crap. No, I think (laughs) I would agree with that. If a joke bombed, it wasn't, like, he wasn't upset about it. He just kept going. He went with it, yeah. And, And, like, even if it didn't land in the audience in the studio people at home still found it hysterical it's like how you know people say that um if you were in person for the the kennedy nixon debate you thought that nixon won but if you were watching it at home you thought that kennedy won like do do you know what i'm talking about Yeah. yeah so like 
it, it just it feels like that same dichotomy right of like why is nobody getting this guy why is nobody following you know his his train of thought i love him on jeopardy on snl oh, jeopardy Turd Turd ferguson, ferguson is one of the best <laughs> I love that. I love that name. I mean, everything about that is the awesome. The hat mm-hmm. is incredible. But I, I, the the funniest thing that I have come across so far, and uh, Team Coco reposted it on uh, on YouTube since he passed. But he was on Conan a few years ago and <laughs> told this joke about a moth that. I might even put it in the end of this episode. Like, I love it so much. It's a really long joke. <laughs> I mean, it takes like four minutes for him to get through the entire joke. But it is so well delivered. And so he's just, he's, he was such a tour de force. And I just can't believe that he is gone. <laughs> well, it's kind of like that, like with Chadwick. It's like oh yeah, absolutely. Unless that I was guess, a, that was another big gut. It was punch. just kind of out of nowhere, and then you yeah. find out that like oh they've been dealing with this stuff for a while, and it's just not been public. And you know, and I respect that, like keeping it to yeah. yourself or to just your family. You know, there's just some things that you want to go on. You don't want people talking about it. You don't want you know what's going to happen eventually, and you know you're just going to do your thing, and you don't have to have everybody on the internet and man it, it it is so hard though watching and and listening to Chadwick Boseman's final performances knowing that he was battling colon cancer and knowing that you know he was pretty well aware of the fact that he wasn't going to last much yeah. longer but i mean it just breaks my heart because of how talented he was mm-hmm. honestly And I think I might have said this on the podcast before, too. The more I think about it, Chadwick Boseman is probably my favorite actor of all time. Hands down. I've never seen him in anything where I have been disappointed by his performance or not fully believed what he is doing on screen, who he is portraying in a role. And I'm... It does... Cancer freaking sucks, man. It does. (laughs) F cancer. F cancer indeed. But that's that's I had a couple of tips and bits, but that was the big thing is go watch some Norm McDonald. Do it. Watch some sketches. SNL like it's Absolutely. just so good. Go watch him on on uh weekend update. Yes. Seth Meyers uh was talking about one weekend update he did where <laughs> he was talking about the richest girl in the world and he was like how could you tell that she was the richest girl in the world? Well, at her birthday party, they had two cakes. It's <laughs> <laughs> so perfect. Oh, it's just uh, the delivery, too. Oh, yeah, for sure. Anyway, what you got going on, buddy? I, uh, so I reread a graphic novel the other day. Nice. Um, you know him. It's Jeff Lemire, or mm-hmm. Jeff Lemire, however mm-hmm. you want to say his last name. Uh, I love his just original stories where he does the story and the art. And there is a graphic novel called The Underwater Welder. Ooh, okay. And it's about a guy who his job, he works off like the coast and like, I think like big oil rigs and stuff. And his job is to go way down to the bottom of the depths of the ocean and weld to make sure that the rig stays, you know, intact. Yeah. And at one point he gets down there and he starts seeing like a spirit and this like supernatural being like connects him with the ghost of his dad. So he's going under there doing this job that he just does normally. And now all of a sudden he's revisiting his father. And it's it's just this story about, you know, father, son, memory, supernatural, like, and it all revolves around this unique job, the under, That's really cool. underwater welder. Yeah. And it's just a job that you never would think like, hey, I'm going to write a comic book about the underwater welder. Yeah. But when you think about it, that's a crazy job. Like oh, yeah. you're welding at the bottom of the ocean on these big rigs and stuff. So I highly recommend that. I recommend pretty much anything Jeff Lemire writes and all his original stuff that's outside of like Marvel and all that. He does the art himself. 
It's spectacular. I'm gonna have to pick it up on Comixology if it's it's great on there. You can borrow. It. I have the uh, I have okay, the physical sure. copy. Yeah, sure. I'll bring it over. Did you ever get through uh, Spider Man Life Story? <sighs> it's one of the best Spider Man stories I've read. In a I long know. Time. <laughs> I was a I big know. I was a big fan of um, One More Day storyline and all that. I, I, I enjoyed it. I know. It. Yeah, I, I know. And I'm not going to criticize you for that because there's no reason why somebody would. I didn't think it was that bad. I understand why people were upset with it, but it's like, come, come on. Like, but coming back always, around, there are always status quo changes yeah. in in comic books. But I think we both agree that this is one of the best Spider-Man I, stories. I genuinely, I I read it. I go back and read it. Literally every like month or two, because of how in love I am with that that whole story, to the point where like, even if it's characters that I don't like anymore, or or stories that I might not care much for, if Chip Zdarsky has written it, I am buying that book. Yeah, like he has sold me on everything <laughs> that that he has done, and, and it's just like. It's just like bourbon, like comic books and stuff. It's just like bourbon. It's like you find that company or that distiller or that blender that you like. Yeah. You're probably going to buy a product. Even if they leave this company, you know, and do this, you're probably going to want to try that. So your favorite writer writes this comic book, then he decides to write another one or something like that. You're more than likely going to follow him and you're more than likely going to enjoy it. When I do this, um, this spinoff show about <clears throat> creators that I love where I get to interview them. I really want to interview Chip Zdarsky. Really, really want to talk to him. I, I mean, even if it's not just about Spider-Man life story, like I just got to know how the guy thinks and, you know, doing, so I want to talk about something too that I've never really discussed on the show before, but when I was in college, I was studying to be an English teacher and so i've always had like this love for for writing and and crafting stories and also like um even like essays like my my favorite class that i ever took in high school was uh ap ap lang ap language and it helped me to develop critical thinking and also to learn how to build arguments and, and read text to where I could, you know, infer meaning and, and metaphors and, you know, find different little things. But at the same time, it had all this kind of impact on me where it was like, I want to be able to create things and I want to craft stories. And a big thing that has come of that is when we do Last Call, right? Right. And Last Call has always been so rewarding for me and so much fun because not only am I getting to to do these goofy stories and, and you know, improv a scene, but I also get to just build this world. And I, I get to be creative. And if if nothing else, and there's plenty of other things, but if I look back on the podcast... And, you know, I, I say, well, there was this period where I got to be really fun and really goofy and just everything that I could possibly throw at the wall stuck. I will be very happy with that. But I also want to, you know, take the time to talk to people who have influenced me creatively. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's one of those things that, you know, I, I listen to podcasts that I don't talk about on the show, Right. Mm -hmm. I read things that I don't talk about on the show, but everything that I am influenced by in one way or another makes it to the final product of this show in one way or another. Did I say that? Did I say in one way or another twice? You may have. I think I did. But I completely fun. agree because yeah. <laughs> I listen to you and I hear the way you talk. I hear the words you use. Sometimes I'm like, I don't even know what that word means, <laughs> but it sounds awesome. <laughs> and like that does come out. Like I can tell, like, you know, you got that background going in school. And then, you know, based on what you listen to and the writers you like, like it, it's you. And I'm sure that 
the stuff like you're probably like, oh, this guy watches a lot of Tim and Eric because I mean, I'm just saying the most weird well, random stuff. <laughs> So here we are. <laughs> but that's, I don't even really have anything to say off of the back of that. But I mean, we, I don't, I don't think that it matters one way or another what, what background we come from. But I mean, the fact that we are who we are. And I think that, you know, we have spent so much time stroking our own ego since you've been on the show. <laughs> but, I genuinely think that I could not have asked for a better co-host for the show since you came along. Um, and that's not to say that I had bad ones before, but like this is where we need to be right now. And this is what we needed for the future. So. Cheers. I don't care. Cling. Oh, I've got one more. One more what? Tips and bits. You do? I do. One oh, more. Okay. I'm going to get real right now. Uh-oh. There, there's something happening on around my social media oh. right now. I just want everybody to be aware of. I mean, I feel like people are getting to know me a little bit more. They may go to my Instagram page. If you see someone with the name Better Than Eric commenting, liking, please just ignore this person. He may or not, he may or may not be associated with Extra Crispy Chad. I don't know the relationship they have. Me and Extra Crispy, we've had some ups and downs lately. I'm not going to go into details on that. You can ask me about it later. But now there is this better than Eric person on Instagram. And you if you saw the live right now, you saw him. He actually came into the live and interrupted our party. I don't know how he got the StreamYard link. I honestly think he just lied his way around to get it from someone. It's totally possible. He probably acted like he was just going to be a special guest, and he wanted to, you know, congratulate you on a thousand. Maybe he asked Swan. Swan's a nice guy. He gave him the link, and then he just did his own thing and ruined our moment. But it was five minutes. I'm never going to get back. No, but if you see this guy better than Eric. Possibly my daily bourbon on Instagram. He's got like 4,000 followers. He's got a nice beard. He does great reviews. I don't know if they're the same person. He's also called X Crispy Chad. He's not the real Chad. He was on his uh, It's Bourbon Night, and he took a bottle that he was going to give to me. He didn't give it to me. He opened it with the real Chad, who he tries to be, but he's not. And they shared that bottle of bourbon on It's Bourbon Night, and I don't have any hard feelings about that. This better than Eric person... He may try to follow you. He may try to comment. He may say bad stuff about me. Ignore him. That is my tip, my last tip for the day. Sounds like it goes all the way to the top. It's past the top. Wow. Do you mean Jesus? Jesus would never be this mean to somebody. That's all I'm saying. He hurt me. You heard it here first, folks. Don't follow better than Eric. I don't want to take sides for or against my daily bourbon because he's still my friend. He's my friend too, but I think he's, there's something behind the shadows he's doing right now. All right. Now. Well, we'll leave that for the time being. I'm not sure what's going to happen there. Anyway, thank you all so much for listening this week. Really appreciate you guys. Uh, where can people find you on social media, Eric? Find me on Instagram at whiskey mutant. Um, Pairing bourbon, whiskey with whatever you want me to do. Cakes, anime, movies. I got some reels on there. I got a new reel. I made a music video. Man, that reel is so good, dude. Check it out. So oh, That was fantastic. Uh, if you want to follow me personally, I'm at PureRitter1492 on all social media channels. If you want to follow the show itself, it's at my bourbon pond on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Actually, also on TikTok. I've got one really good TikTok, and then everything else is just kind of like... Don't swim. <laughs> I love that. I was so proud of that. It's done well. I mean, it, it's, I it's, it's awesome. It's gotten a lot of good views and whatnot. Anyway, uh, what else? You can send questions or comments to this is my bourbon shop at gmail.com. You can also leave us a five star rating and review in your podcast app of choice, or 
You can leave a review anywhere on any service, pot, any app, anything. But if you screenshot it and send it to Eric, and we're talking like Candy Crush, we're talking yeah, Instagram like Instagram app, anything. You know, your money saving app, whatever. Just take a screenshot of it, send it to Eric, and he will read it out on the show. Just like this one. This comes from Fred Gilbert. He left a five star review on Google Chrome. He says, <laughs> that's, that's so funny. The way he does this, too, the framing of it is spectacular. So he screenshotted this. He messaged me, and this is a, under the review of Google Chrome. <laughs> five stars. It may not be the best way to do it, but it's possible to use Chrome. <laughs> Listen to one of the greatest podcasts on the planet. This is my bourbon podcast. Otherwise, it's a pretty competent and reliable browser. <laughs> Fred Gilbert. Five and stars. Five stars. Five and see stars. what he did there? It's perfect because he made it. I don't know. Are if we going to be on an FBI watch list eventually? Because I know, feel like we are. <laughs> I don't know if they actually read these reviews first and then put them on there. But he made it in a way. That it just helped everybody. He got it on there. He added a little bit of Chrome. He talked about us. And then ended with Chrome. And it made it. So, thanks, Fred. That's just spectacular. Oh, my gosh. I love that so much. Uh, no new reviews on the actual podcast app this week. But maybe next week. <laughs> or You know, it would really be helpful if people could actually send us a review on the podcast itself. Instead of someplace else. That being said, keep doing that. <laughs> Please do both things. <laughs> uh, you can also send us a voicemail for Barrel Rings at 859-428-8253. We'll listen to that live on air. You can uh, also find all of our apparel and merchandise at bourbonshop.threadless.com. That big pick energy shirt's got to go up soon. I, I, can't, I can't put it off any longer. It's mm -hmm. got to be on the site. We, we got to hook up with a uh, energy drink company and let us call something <laughs> big, <laughs> big, big energy. I love it so much. Uh, YouTube.com slash This My Bourbon Podcast. Go subscribe to that channel, please. It helps us a lot. I'm going to be putting up a new video soon. I hope. And then last but not least, Patreon.com slash My Bourbon Podcast for as little as a dollar a month. You can support the show for as little as five bucks a month. You get a whole bunch of bonus content, including the pregame chats and the last call which i waxed poetic about a little bit earlier it's fun we had a really fun one last week so the last call i think is going to be every other week ish maybe like twice a month we'll see yeah but regardless that does it for this week did you say something we were going to do something next week didn't you bring something up next week yeah what was next week i don't know um <laughs> I don't know. We're we'll going to do a podcast. Out. We're going to do a podcast next week. That's a first for us. Let's do it. In 197 episodes, we're going to do our first podcast. Get ready. I'm going to renumber it <laughs> from one. <laughs> we get to one. You get to 199 and it turns into like DC Comics and they just, re you re redo the whole This Is My Bourbon Podcast universe and start uh, all over. Oh my goodness. Anyway. That does it for this week's episode. Thank you all so much Thanks, for guys. listening. We'll see you next week. But until then, I'm Perry. I'm Eric. And this is my bourbon podcast. Mm -hmm.